Each one of us spends our lives surrounded by others. Our days are filled with meetings, friend requests, texts, emails, and small talk. How could it be with all of this interaction, the epidemic of loneliness still erodes people's joy? Have our pursuits for connection been mistaken as community? Simply belonging to a club or being part of the crowd? Collecting virtual relationships with fans, friends, and followers. What if belonging to community meant more than attendance or subscription? Imagine a group of people that fight for each other, that see the best in each other, even in moments of failure. Imagine a group of people that actually enjoy one another. If we know each other, we can love each other. This kind of community changes us. We become ruthlessly committing to preserving it, building it, and welcoming others into it. When this happens, loneliness fades, hope grows, and we become better than we were before. That's why Jesus told us that community is something we dedicate our lives to. So much depends on it. Sadly, that dog is no longer with us, and those children are much, much, much bigger, especially those Carluchis. I don't know what they're being fed. But what we're going to do today is a little bit different. We are celebrating the last uh, Sunday of our established series, and we're going to move into our element of community. And one of the things that we have preached a lot of messages on community, can I get a witness on that, please? Yes. So what I decided to do is I have a three-hour seminar that I'm going to be doing for the rest of today. Just kidding. We want to break it up a little bit. And instead of one sermon, what we want to do is we want to have four of our pastors share stories of how their lives have been impacted by community and how that is the fuel in which they then create community here at Cornerstone in and through their ministry. So what we're going to do is we're going to hear stories of how lives have been changed by community and how that has fueled the passion to create community for others. And so we have four individuals, Carrie Casada, Dan Lance, Joyce Larson, and Tim Caressel are going to share. We're going to weave some music through, so get ready for an exciting time. And without further ado, Miss Community Yourself, Carrie Casada. Good morning. All right. Um, I'm not sure if I'm alone in this, but... Um, I have noticed recently that for my own emotional, mental, spiritual health, I am really having to, on a daily basis, kind of pull my lens back and see the bigger picture. And in doing that, really trying to focus in on gratitude. And um, this weekend, my husband had a really great idea that we pulled out our um, hard drive that contains years and years and years of videos and photos from when my kids were little, little. And um, we got to watch those together and we laughed together, looking back on their little baby voices and even just their personality traits that at that age, you know, they still shine through now. And it was really sweet because a lot of our laughter actually turned into tears that like, we, like just hit you because you didn't even know where they came from. And I was ref as I was watching these videos and reflecting back on those years, I was reminded of a season that community meant more than I think I even understood in the whirlwind of raising little kids. Um, my, when my youngest two, Emma and Eli, were like two and under, I will tell you that those years of my life were very, very lonely. Um, Josh worked really long days, and I was at home really long days on my own with two littles, trying to figure out what it meant for me to be a mom. And um, those were the days, and can I get a witness on this, where like a trip to Target was like the best thing of your whole week. And um, yeah, and if you came across another human being, another adult, you were a little unsure if you even remembered how to have an adult conversation anymore. Um, and what I realized is that those were actually some really hard and actually very depressing years of my life. 
And, but now, in hindsight, I can see that it was in that time that God actually really forcefully nudged me towards people. And what I began to do is I began stepping out and had to be really vulnerable and saying to other moms, like, hey, this is where I'm at. What about you? And then what I quickly saw is that I was definitely not alone in that. So out of that season, um, I began to create a really incredible mom community that we would meet together at the park. And while we were pushing our kids on the swings, we began to share life with one another, share the hardships, share the joy, share all of those things. And those, those days at the park grew into some really deep-seated friendships that are now still some of my greatest friends. Um, and what I will tell you is that flash forward years later, our family, um, felt called by the Lord to move here to Colorado and move away from my hometown and away from that community. But ironically, me sitting in this seat today, even as a pastor now has a great deal to do with that season of my life. Um, because it was in that season that God showed me how incredibly, incredibly important doing life together is. That we as humans are not created to do this as an island on our own. That we've been created to live life alongside each other. And so um, that really bleeds a lot into what I do here at Cornerstone with the ministry um, with our kids. I have a deep, deep passion for our kids to feel known and seen and belong. We talk a lot about being a part of a bigger family here at Cornerstone. And um, so we do that together on Sundays. We laugh we pray, we sing together, we, we walk alongside each other as things are hard. And what's really cool is that that longing for our kids to be connected actually has trickled down into my volunteer team. And what my volunteer team is seeing is that they're not just a part of being here for the kids, but they are, the kids are very much so a part of their community. I just got a text from a volunteer this week that was like missed last week. And he said, man, I don't think I realize how much those kids mean to me in my weekly life. So if you're looking for a place to serve, I would love to plug you in. Um, but on a greater scale, too, as parents, I really have a deep longing for you not to feel alone in this journey. So um, that is another part of just what I love to do is just supporting you for you to find one another as you raise up your littles. And um, on that note, I would love to invite up um, someone that I call um, a co-parent with me, um, Dan and Alyssa Lance. We, we do a lot of parenting together because there's no way we were survive not just littles, but teenagers alone. So Dan's going to come up and share his story. Thank you, Carrie. That was awesome. <clears throat> it takes a village. We have quite the village between our couple families. Um, my experience with community has really shaped every major decision of my life. Um, without community, I think I'd be a giant disaster. And um, I'll start just by sharing about our move here to Colorado. That definitely had a lot to do with community. Um, you're about to get the backstory really quickly of how a lot of us actually ended up here on staff. And I don't know if you know this story, but it's kind of wild. Um, I was roommates with this guy back here in college. And um, we nine years ago, we both found ourselves pastoring uh, different churches in Redding, California, which is where we went to college. And um, Aaron's time had come to an end at that church, and he had gotten a call from this weird little church in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, to, to come on staff and he was excited about that, and it's where uh, Destry's parents lived, and Destry's sister Shelby um, had, was married to this guy named Gabe on staff that was, works with students and stuff like that, and so there's this whole family connection, and um, Destry had longed to get back to Colorado, and so they were in the process of moving, and I remember distinctly, I had this, um, I had just been let go at the church that I was at, and that was devastating, and I didn't know what to do, and I knew that Aaron was leaving, and I, <laughs> I remember this conversation we had. I, I sat him down. I said, bro, I haven't asked you for anything major in our entire friendship. I'm asking right now, do not leave me. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that? that was, okay. I said, I said, do not leave me. I can't do this, and he said, uh, Destry's making me. 
And I was like, then I knew it was over at that point. I was like, all right. So at that point, I just talked to Alyssa and I said, okay, change of plans. Like, we, we need to move. <laughs> I was like, we can't stay in Reading. And it's so important to me that we live in community. Like, at that point in our lives, we weren't going to make it. Like, we had to be around people that knew us and love, loved us. And we moved to Colorado because of that. That's why we're here. Um, so there was only one problem in all of that. So we were here now, but Josh and Carrie Casada were in Riverside, California, and they had put their house on the market, and they were completely excited to move to Redding, California, where we were, <laughs> because they wanted to be a part of the community that we had started up there, and that was so important to them. They wanted to be around people that they knew and loved, and we were like, so I remember distinctly being in Costco, and I called Josh, and I'm like, Josh, I don't even know how to start this conversation. I know that you've sold your house and you're moving to Reading, but I just got fired and I'm moving with Aaron and we're going to Colorado. And I said, how do you feel about Colorado? He's like, yeah, let's do it. So that's how the Casadas ended up here. Um, so they moved, now eight years later, all three of us are on staff together. No one saw that coming. I've known Carrie since she was in fourth grade. Aaron and I went to college together. Um, so if you ever wonder how three California kids ended up on staff together, I blame Destry and Costco. Um, I, I think those were the reasons we all ended up here. Community was so important to us, though, that we were willing to take our kids, our families, everything that we knew at the time, and risk it all to be around people that knew and loved us. It was that important. Um, while we were in Reading, we had amazing community. And I had this group of guys that we threw together on Sunday nights we would never miss. We were all in ministry together or at different churches and all over Reading. And we usually had something going on Sunday night, like a service or something like that. We would run from that. We'd hang out around a fire till 2 in the morning. We were like useless on Mondays. And, but we would never miss. And it was in those times when I was surrounded by those guys that, I mean, so many life-changing things happened. And uh, really things that impacted the trajectory of my life. And um, I, I owe it to those guys. And the way that I was able to be open and honest with them, it was really awesome. So when I came here, I pitched the idea for fire groups. Um, I just knew that it was that important. And what I know is that it's difficult at times for me, I'm just speaking personally, to hear the voice of the Lord on my own. But in community, I, I hear him all the time through my friends. And sometimes when you can't hear it just from God himself, like friends putting their hands on your shoulders and screaming at you in the face, that's a lot easier to hear. <laughs> and, and it's in those times where I've heard the voice of the Lord through my friends and one thing I know for sure is that the Holy Spirit lives in my friends. And I've been able to be shaped and moved by conversations with so many guys that are just really close to me. Um, and my dream for Cornerstone, specifically the men of Cornerstone, is that I just want everyone to experience that. I want each guy to know that they are known, that they can share their life with another guy, that they can like have someone in their life that knows everything about them. That's so important to me. Um, we can't do it alone. That's just one thing that I know deep in my bones. I know that Dan Lance, without my wife Alyssa, and without my friends, is a disaster. You don't want that guy making decisions for the church. Promise. Like, I need to be surrounded, I need to be harnessed, I need to be tethered. It is so important that I'm surrounded by people. We need these types of people in our lives to become all that God has called us to be. And we talk about community all the time, but I just want you to know that I would not be the man that I am today without the guys and the people in my life that have surrounded me. And so I just encourage you in every way possible that if you consider that this place your home, really invest in the people here. 
lifelong friends. We, we've been willing to move all over the country to be around people that matter to us because it's that important. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Back to this.
God who meets us right where we're at. And what a mystery, Lord, that you show us your love, your truth, your presence, your power through others. Would you open us up, Lord, to see what you are doing in and through the people around us. And as you call us to you, you call us to one another. We praise you for this in your name, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Grab a seat. I want to welcome our next story. Joyce Larson is pastor of Life Group and Women's. She's a counselor. She's so many things. She's a keyboardist. She does so many things. But if you are welcome to the stage, Joyce Larson. Hi, everyone. It's good to be with you this morning. Well, um, as we've been talking about, community has been so impactful for me, so I just want to share a couple of stories with you this morning. Um, but, you know, we all need family, but then we also need spiritual parents. Brian mentioned that the other week, and I was grateful to get to go to church with my family, um, but I would say I didn't really learn about what it looked like to walk with Jesus um, in depth through my family, and so I have had a lot of different spiritual parents. Um, there are two that I really want to highlight today for you. Um, one was when I was in college, I had a woman who mentored me and she was a mother of ch uh, school-aged children. So very busy, as you can imagine. A lot of you are in that season right now. But she just invited me into the regular rhythms of her life with her. And that was so valuable for me. Um, so, you know, from the outside looking in, you probably wouldn't have seen anything special about our times together, nothing extraordinary. But many of our conversations were had in her car in the pickup line waiting to get her kids from school, or unloading groceries, or washing dishes at her house. And now looking back, I'm just so grateful for those moments because she taught me so much what it looked like to be faithful in the seemingly mundane, in the day-to-day, -day. Um, gave me a picture into motherhood. Fast forward to another season of life when I was engaged and I approached an older single woman to mentor me. And she looked a little taken aback and said, I'm really honored that you want to meet with me, but wouldn't you rather meet with a married woman in this season? And I just looked at her and I said, you know, there are actually a lot of qualities about your relationship with Christ that I would like to emulate and learn from, so I actually want to meet with you. <laughs> um, but I share those stories um, just to let you know that there are so many people who have poured into my life over the years, both men and women, even though I talked about women today, people of all ages, people with varying life experiences. And as a result of learning from all of those people, I carry a little part of them in my faith journey now, and they have really made my faith journey so much richer. So my encouragement for all of you, and especially um, in women's ministry and life groups, is that I really want every single person to know that no matter your age, no matter what season you find yourself in, that God wants to use you. He wants to use your story. He wants to use what you perceive to maybe be limitations. That might be the very thing that God uses to make an impact to bless somebody else's um, life. And so, you know, use your stories, use your brokenness, use your pain, um, whatever he has for you and, and whatever he has in front of you right now. Um, he wants you to be able to share that with other people. So I know we've talked about it, you know, Dan and Carrie shared as well, but don't be afraid to pursue other people. So I have many stories about relationships where people pursued me, but there are others where I pursued them. And so don't be afraid to reach out and pursue others because I think that your faith journey will be so much richer because of that. And now Tim Kressel is going to come up and share with you. Yeah, thank you. 
How are you guys doing this morning? I got married in 2007 after graduating from Colorado State University. Oh, okay. Uh, when Lindsay and I got married, um, we thought we would be in Boulder and at Cornerstone for the long haul. Uh, I was on staff here. Uh, we loved the church. We loved our friends. Uh, we had family here in the area. But less than a year later, uh, we would unexpectedly pick up everything, pack it up, and move to Seattle. And um, it's not something that we anticipated ever doing. And, uh, but somehow we sensed that God was, was leading us and calling us to make that move. And... I was not excited. Um, in fact, I remember uh, taking uh, Gabe Kinsley out to coffee, who uh, Gabe's on staff here. He's one of the pastors. He's one of my closest friends, and we were doing ministry, youth ministry here. And so I took him out to coffee to break the news, and I just, like, started crying. I mean, like, ugly crying. And then he started ugly crying. And then we were these two dudes who were in their mid-20s just, like, making a total scene in the coffee shop. People are looking around like, what is going on? We're like, we should probably just go outside and cry out there. But uh, I, was, I was afraid. Um, we had no relationships there, no network, no community, and no clue. <laughs> um, but we did it. We set out, and we were on our own, and we were alone. And uh, as hard as that was, um, and I swore I would never do it again, we did it again. Just five years later, we would pack everything up, and we would move to the other side of the country, to Washington, D.C., a place I had never been before in my entire life, never even visited. I missed the sixth grade trip out to the Capitol, right? I, it was like cold turkey showing up in Northern Virginia, right outside of DC. Uh, and again, I, I, we didn't know a soul there. And uh, it would be another five years before coming back to Boulder and coming back to Cornerstone. And as you might imagine, with each move, we experienced, we experienced a lot of loneliness. Um, we struggled with not knowing how to settle in a, in a new place and a new culture. And uh, on top of that, I mean, these were extremely formative years for us. We were newly married. We were trying to figure out how to do that. We're still kind of trying to figure out how to do that. We had all three of our children during those years. Um, we were just setting out in the world of, of post-college careers. That, like in the midst of like a recession, that was really interesting. Um, and we experienced some really hard times. We experienced the death of family members and loved ones. And there were health scares and there were ma major surgeries and and there were so many of life's ups and downs as we were just trying to figure out how to navigate the world of, of marriage and parenting and really just adulthood. And all of that we were doing away from the comfort of home. We were doing that away from the comfort of being close to family, close to friends, and close to all the familiar faces and places. Um, but, you know, fast forward to now, and I think about our lives now, and I realize that despite how scary or difficult it was to, to launch into unfamiliar places um, and to do that and how hard it was, uh, we got through it okay. But not only that, but I think about our life now, and I'm like, dude, we are more than okay. My family, I think about it, and I, I marvel, like, our family is stronger than ever. Our marriage is stronger than ever. Our faith is stronger than ever. And I feel like we are healthier and more spiritually formed than we were when we set out 14 years ago. And so much of that is because of the Christ-centered community we experienced in each new place that we went. Community that wasn't waiting for us when we got there. And it was really just a few, uh, a few key friendships that provided us a sense of home away from home that made all the difference for us. People who were willing to love us, people who were willing to, to let us into their lives, and people who made us feel like we belonged when we felt like strangers and aliens. Um, and, it, it was, it, and it wasn't just our church community. It was, if I think about it, it was our church community, but it was really just a few, just a few individuals, a few wonderful people that in our church community that did that for us. And, and to me, that's the power of community. It really doesn't take a whole lot of it to change your life. One person can, can be a game changer for you. 
And, uh, you know, I think that sometimes we can have this conception of community that, you know, in order to really experience it in my church, I need to know everybody. I need to be, like, deeply rooted in a ton of relationships in my church. I need to be besties with everybody. But really, sometimes it just takes a couple people to keep you grounded. It, sometimes it only takes one or two people to come alongside you to fight your battles alongside you and to, to help you grow and to rise up to the potential that God has put in you. And to use Aaron's language from earlier, I mean, this has become the fuel for me in my ministry and serving this community here in Boulder and in Cornerstone. And my experiences, uh, this experience has become my vision for for the community here and, and helping it, helping create community for people here, especially for our college and young adults, who many of them are away from home, moving to Boulder, uh, sometimes moving away from home for the first time to go to school, to do research, do an internship, uh, their first job. Sometimes they just want to move and, and move to a rad place, and my heart is to help them experience home here, for them to, to belong and to be loved, to have a community of people who's willing to fight for them, help them grow and to rise up to their God-given potential. And all of this makes me think a lot about what the scripture says in Ephesians 2, 19. And I'll wrap up with this. It says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You see, the good news that Jesus brings to our life is that we are no longer outsiders and strangers, but we are invited into God's family. And I have, I have experienced this reality in no greater way than through God's people, than through the power of community. Thank you.
Go ahead and grab a seat. I'm going to share a couple quick stories, and then we're going to have a little time of prayer. But Brian Carlucci is not the only football player on Cornerstone staff, I'll have you know. In 1994, I played backup tight end, third string, point after touchdown, whatever it's called, PAT, I believe it is, third string in that. I was the fourth string defensive back. And I even think I was a kicker, but I actually wasn't even one of the strings. That's how far down it was. But I'll tell you the reason that I was on the football team. I had played basketball my entire life, and it was what my passion was. And then my junior year, I had a coach. You know, everyone has a coach that hates them. This guy hated me. Like, he just... He spoke to me in profanity, just like did not want me to exist. And so I began to just make a lot of poor choices. And I ended up uh, breaking my, I ended up having ankle surgery. And then I ended up actually with a group of friends going to a party and getting kicked off of the basketball team. Needless to say, things were not going well for me. And then Mark Pettengill, the football coach for Foothill High School, came to me and says, I want you to play for me. Now... At five foot 11, 140 pounds with running a 40 at like seven minutes and a half, I was not what you say a prospect for football. But Mark Pettengale was a Christian and he ran Fellowship of Christian Athletes and he says, I want you to be part of my team. And he invited me in. And he even, I should have brought it, I didn't, but I was embarrassed. He even gave me number seven because he knew my dad was a pastor and he knew that I came and had grown up with faith and he saw me just making poor choices everywhere. And he gave me number seven and he invited me to his team and he put me on the team and he even let me start a couple games. And our team went from 0 and 10 because we were all juniors to 10 and 0 and ended up set, setting two national records that I am nowhere in any of those things. But I get to say I was a part of that team because Mark Pettengill saw someone who was off making poor choices and he created a space for me to belong. And that was a powerful sense of community. Fast forward. I'm headed into college, and I'm through that. I'm worried about the choices that I'm going to make. And there was a youth group, a large youth group, and I started attending that, and they found out that I played guitar. And they were like, hey, we want you to lead worship for our canoe trip. And I said, I don't know your songs, and it's a charismatic church. And they're like, the Lord will lead you in that. <laughs> that is not following the Spirit. That's a cruel joke that Christians do, to, uh, that leaders do to young people to watch them fail. And so I'm like making up the song as it goes, and the people are trying to sing like, oh, great job. And I loved it because they invited me in once again, created a space, saw a little bit of gifting, and they didn't even mock me when I didn't know what I was doing. But over the next years, they allowed me to learn to lead worship, and it became one of the biggest passions of my life because this group of people created a space for me to belong. Fast forward once again, I moved to Redding, California. And this is where Dan and my stories overlap. And I was there and I had been making music and it was something that was really exciting and something that I loved. And Dan said, I'm starting a record label and I'm starting this thing called the Rooster Party and I want you to be a part of it. Now the thing about it is, on the hierarchy, if they had like top 100 musicians in Reading, I wasn't on the list. 
But Dan and Jeremy and a group of people, they invited me into that. And they said, we want to create a space. And we want to call something out of you. And we want you to belong to this. And I was able to make a couple records. And it was the most powerful and incredible experience. And then we went on tour and Dan says, I have a friend. His name is Josh. And he'll meet us in the San Francisco area. And three seconds before we met, he had already learned the songs. And we played together. And what happened is, once again, there was a group of people who created a space for me to belong, even though I didn't have the skill or the ability or much to offer, they created a place to say, we want you to belong, we believe in you, and we want to see you grow in your gifting. Now, why do I share that? You guys can start playing that song again, because I need to sing it. That's what I believe and what I want for Cornerstone. That's the passion that I see as I came here after Gabe came in and I was in a place that was difficult in Reading. And Gabe's like, hey, we're hiring a worship pastor. And I said, at your weird church? And he said, yes, at our weird church. I said, do I need to, wear, do I need to learn Hebrew? He says, most likely. <laughs> and I said, well, all right. I've learned other things. And then... Cornerstone creates a place after I had had three really disappointing years in Redding, California. And me and my friends who were in a rough spot got to come to Boulder, Colorado. And Cornerstone invited and welcomed us and actually threw a party for us the first time we visited. And we were able to do a concert. And the people of Cornerstone came around us to love us and to welcome us. And so my challenge is in this to say, not let's be a community, but I want to celebrate the fact that I am a testimony that Cornerstone is a community that creates a place where people can belong, where people are believed in, and people can grow in their gifting. And my challenge is that we will partner together. And when we sing this, I will climb that mountain with my hands wide open. And because of COVID, I'm not going to have you grab the hands of someone next to you but spiritually touch their hands. But the idea of we are ascending a mountain together as a community, and we're creating a place where people can belong, can believe in, and can grow in their giftings. So we go back, before we go back into this, I want you to take a moment. Where have you experienced the goodness of God in community in your own life? Take a moment and think about that. felt his presence? Where have you heard his voice? Where have you experienced his love in community? Everybody got a memory? If you don't, some of us need to take a little bit more time. I want you to think about that today. But now my next question is, how are you gonna create that experience for someone else? How are you gonna take the impact and the transformation that that caused in your life and how are you gonna now embody that and live that out to invite someone else into that? Take a moment and think about how the Lord is calling you to create that for other people. And now I bless you in Jesus' name that you will celebrate the places where you've experienced the goodness of God through community. And I pray a greater empowerment of the Holy Spirit and Jesus through the scriptures in your life that you may begin to cultivate that and create that in the people around you, in your home, in your workplace, through this church, in the marketplace, in your neighborhoods. I bless you with that in Jesus' name. And now as we go back into this song, there's a reason why we sing Surrender, a song of surrender. It's because community is tough. And we have to surrender to Jesus to say, Jesus, regardless of what has happened, I'm pressing in because I've experienced your goodness through community 
And I want to create a place where others can experience your goodness through community. Will you stand with us as we sing this song one more time and close? yourself and you call us to each other. May you do all you want to do in and through this little cornerstone, this little church. Lord, I pray against, pray against the spirit of offense, the spirit of division. Lord, that in this moment as we hear the stories and we remember, it may break those offenses and it may break that division and that we will look to you and we will enter back into relationship with one another, for we were made for it. We praise you for it. In the name of Jesus, our Messiah, amen. And if you grab a seat, I think we need to hear a little bit more from Kerry Casada. so. On the first Sunday in November, over 100 Boulder County kids will take this track to run their little hearts out. But here's the amazing part. They run not for themselves, but on behalf of 400 kids that live over 8,000 miles away in a rural village in Africa. This year marks our fourth annual Kids for Kids Uganda Run, and it is one of our very favorite events at Cornerstone. You see, we continue to celebrate that over five years ago, God brought a man named David Balbacubo into our lives. A man who had a dream to start a school for the kids in his village in Kamuli, Uganda. A place that the under-resourced and orphaned could be cared for and belong. This partnership has watched an empty plot of land now become a flourishing school. Though our Cornerstone families have made a huge impact over the years to give well over $20,000 to help a dream bloom into a reality, truly the greater gift has been the friendship that has grown between the children of Cornerstone and the children of Divine Wisdom Junior School. And now it's time to build upon the foundations that have been laid. We are invited once again to partner with David to not only change the lives of the students of this school, 
but of the families that are connected to this powerful ministry and movement. This run means something truly special to our kids and their Ugandan friends. Together, they are telling a story of friendship, of hope, and of a brighter future. But you see, this storytelling doesn't happen without your involvement. Through your sponsorship of one of our Cornerstone kids, your gift will be paired with their boundless energy and will bring an unmeasurable impact for the kids of Uganda. Hey Cornerstone, happy Sunday. My name is Jess and my family is so excited that the Uganda Run is back this year. Parents, if you want more info, visit the Uganda table in the courtyard. And if you'd like to sponsor a kid, they have their sponsor sheets. So find a kid and sign up today. Okay, everyone, take out your phones. That's right, I'm gonna tell you to text in church. Save this number you see on your screen in your contacts as Cornerstone text number. We're gonna to continue to use this for a lot of different things here at Cornerstone. For example, you can send in your prayer request to this number, or you can text I'm new, and we'll get you started in getting connected here at Cornerstone. In upcoming events, this Thursday, we're bringing back our Ask the Expert series. We've done these in the past to have in-depth conversations about different parenting issues. This time, we'll be talking about managing our children's anxiety. Childcare will also be provided. If you plan to join us, please text Ask the Expert to this number. On November 1st, we'll have another installment of our Human Stories. This time we'll be talking about immigration and we'll hear real life stories of immigrants and their struggle living undocumented in America. Seating is limited, so please RSVP online. As always, our prayer team is also available to pray with you at the end of each service at the front of the auditorium. And if you're new, stop by the info desk. We'd love to meet you and give you a little gift. Thank you to all of our regular givers for your continued generosity. If you would like to begin to partner with us financially, there are many secure ways to do so online. That's it for me today. Have a great Sunday. Go love well.